welcome everyone to this exciting event organized by Ryerson University's Faculty of Arts. My name is Tani Mukhopadhyay and I am a public affiliate at the Faculty of Arts and formerly senior researcher at the Human Development Report Office of the United Nations Development Program. We take this moment to acknowledge that Toronto is in the dish with one spoon territory. The dish with one spoon is a treaty between the Anishinaabe, the Mississaugas and the Haudenosaunee that bound them to share territory and protect the land. Subsequent indigenous nations and peoples, Europeans and all newcomers have been invited into this treaty in the spirit of peace, friendship and respect. Today's event, organized by the Faculty of Arts at Ryerson, also coincides with the International Development Week celebrated by Global Affairs Canada. We hope to contribute to ongoing discussions regarding gender equality, diversity and equity, both in Canada and to learn from experiences globally. I now invite you to listen to the Dean of the Faculty of Arts, Dean Pam Sugiman. So, uh, to make a few welcome remarks before we open today's session with our exceptional panel of political leaders, practitioners, leading academics, and policy experts, and our very gracious host, Pia Sattopadhyay. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Pam Sugaman, Dean of the Faculty of Arts at Ryerson University. I'm delighted to welcome you to our arts event today, Women's Leadership in the COVID-19 Response, Distinct, Effective and Successful Approaches. We're honored to have with us today, Dr. Eileen Devilla, Medical Officer of Health for the City of Toronto, Ontario Regional Chief Rose Ann Archibald, Dr. Nat Natalia Linos, Executive Director of the FXB Center for Health and Human Rights at Harvard University, and Dr. Laurel Weldon, Distinguished Professor of Political Science at Simon Fraser University. In Canada and globally, the pandemic has presented us with both immediate and long-term challenges. And over the course of this pandemic, we have seen women at the center of our response, whether they be frontline healthcare workers, personal support workers, grocery store cashiers, caregivers and cleaners, or in leadership roles in government, the medical profession, and the academy. Drawing on their experiences over the course of the pandemic, our guests today will engage in a honest an open discussion of gender and leadership in the face of this global crisis and the influence of women's leadership in particular in ensuring equity and sustainability in a post-pandemic recovery period. I am very pleased to introduce our moderator for today's event, Pia Chattopadai. With over two decades of experience, Pia has been a reporter and host for both radio and television, both in Canada and abroad. Currently, Pia hosts CBC Radio's the, Sun, the Sunday Magazine, and globally, she's reported from many locations, including Sri Lanka, Afghanistan, India, Israel, Lebanon, Egypt, the Palestinian territories, Kenya, the United Kingdom, and France. And Pia is no stranger to Ryerson, for she's also a graduate of Ryerson's journalism program. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for that really generous introduction. Um, I'm Pia. Um, thank you for joining us. I don't know how many uh, people are watching. I think it's in the hundreds. So thank you for making the time uh, for us today to talk about women and leadership and the things that have been exposed uh, during the pandemic. I will just say that over the past 11 months now, um, if anyone needs a reminder about how long we've been in this pandemic, I've been uh, moderating quite a few events um, virtually. Uh, normally I do those things online, uh, pardon me, in person. Um, and in the past years, of course, there have been uh, many occasions to talk about the role of women um, and the challenges of being a women, women's leader or a woman leader, um, but not um, as much as we've talked about and I've hosted more events about women and leadership and our roles during this pandemic um, than I ever have before. And I think, uh, you know, I'm the type of person who's always kind of 
you know, looking for gifts amongst the muck. And I think one of the gifts of this pandemic has been to allow us to talk with one another as women, but also more broadly with society and talk about um, not only where we've come to and arrived at, but also about all the things the pandemic has revealed. So I would consider this a bit of a gift in the sense that we are finally and forthrightly and openly talking about this out in the open. It has um, been a difficult time uh, for each and every one of you uh, for, and myself for the past 11 months. And I just want to acknowledge that. Um, I hope you've all been treating yourself and the people you love and the strangers too with some grace and kindness. Today, really the next hour and a little is um, a celebration of both women, uh, a celebration of us women, but also um, to talk about the challenges uh, we face. Um, I do want to say, that we are not a monolith, the 51% of us <laughs> in the world. Um, stereotypes um, have a propensity to be dangerous, but they also provide a bit of a lens because there are, under, there are underlying truths to them as well and um, things we can see. Um, I'm just going to introduce the panelists in just a moment, but I want to thank each one of them. They're all very busy and um, being very generous with their time. And uh, I know the pandemic for so many of us um, has provided um, a bit of work from home uh, for some of us, but also it's been an extraordinarily busy, busy time. So I want to thank both the panelists and you who are watching today for giving us your time. I'm going to introduce panelists. I will just make one note before I do that. I'm going to introduce them with their full title and their full name. But um, as we move along today, I'm going to be um, using um, first names. Sometimes, please, uh, sometimes their titles don't read too much into it. We just want to keep this casual and friendly, and it's not meant as any sign of disrespect. And I talk to all the panelists about this and everyone feels okay. So we're going to do that. The other just a little note, two notes. One will have uh, questions coming up at about um, 1245 or so. So uh, you can do that through the chat. Um, and also that Dr. Eileen Davila, um, who all of you know is very busy these days, has to depart at 1 p.m. So if you see her um, disappear from your screen, that is why. And so with that, let me introduce um, Dr. Eileen Davila, who um, I think you know because she's on our TVs each and every day and has been for the last 11 months. She is, of course, the Medical Officer of Health for the City of Toronto, and in that role she is leading Toronto's public health. It is our largest, our country's largest local public health agency and working in conjunction, of course, with um, provincial and federal leaders. Toronto Public Health, the agency, provides public health programs and services to Toronto's almost 3 million residents. Dr. Davila received her degrees as Doctor of Medicine and Master of Health Services, Sciences, pardon me, from the University of Toronto. And she also holds a Master of Business Administration from the Schulich School of Business. She's also, in her spare time, <laughs> an adjunct professor at the Dalalana School of Public Health at the University of Toronto. Dr. Dravilla, welcome and thank you for making time for us today. Ontario Regional Chief Roseanne Archibald uh, of the Takwa Tagamo Nation is a calm, respectful and heart-centered leader who for over 25 years uh, has had experience in First Nations politics. She represents generational change, bringing diplomacy and encouraging unity in the First Nations political system while breaking down barriers since the start of her political career. She had, um, since the start of her political career, having been the first woman and the youngest chief for Takwa Tagamo First Nation, deputy grand chief for Nishnabe Aski Nation, grand chief of the, I might get this wrong chief, you might have to help me out, Mushka Gowak. Did I say that correctly? Mishkegawak. Mishkegawak Council. As Ontario Regional Chief, she remains dedicated to empowering women and youth and seeking community-based solutions that encourage capacity building, leadership development, and resiliency. Thank you for joining us today. Dr. Natalia Linos is a social epidemiologist and the executive director of the XFB Center for Health and Human Rights at Harvard. Previously, she worked at the United Nations and the New York, New York City Health Department, tackling some of the most urgent issues of our time, from climate change to structural racism. In 2020, she ran in Democratic primary to represent Massachusetts' fourth district in Congress. Dr. Linos, hi. Dr. Laurel Weldon is a distinguished professor of political science at Simon Fraser University, a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada. She's co-editor of the American Political Science Review. 
Previously, she held a distinguished professorship at Purdue University, where she served as director of the Purdue Policy Research Institute, founding director of the Center for Research on Diversity and Inclusion, interim vice provost for faculty affairs, and very briefly, acting provost. Professor Weldon's work focuses on the role of social movements in influencing public policy, violence against women, representation, women, work and poverty, intersectionality and diversity and inclusion. She has consulted for international organizations such as the UN and the World Bank and has worked for national, local and indigenous governments. Thank you for joining us as well today. Um, so let us get underway in earnest. Um, and I really will ask each one of you, and I'll start uh, just the way I introduced you. So with Dr. Davila, with Eileen, um, just to give us a bit of a sketch of how you've been holding up these past 11 months into this pandemic, both professionally and personally. Well, Pia, that's a really, uh, that's an interesting question. <laughs> and uh, I don't want to take up all the time, but briefly, I would say this. Uh, you know, we've heard time and time again about, uh, you know, this pandemic being described as unprecedented. And, you know, after this is all done, I may never want to use that word again, but it is a very apt descriptor for, you know, I think what many of us are, are living through, particularly those of us who work within the realm of public health. Unprecedented doesn't even begin to capture all of it uh, because there's no question uh, from a professional perspective uh, the pandemic and the response to COVID-19 basically eats up all our time. Uh, you know, there are still other public health issues. And I do try to, as does the team at Toronto Public Health, we do our very best to manage uh, the most uh, pressing of those issues. But clearly COVID-19 is all consuming and does, uh, you know, take up the majority of our time as, as we work through it. Uh, so I would say from a professional perspective for me, uh, you know, a day of work is, again, it depends anywhere between 10 and 18 hours. It just depends on what's going on. And it's seven days a week. There is no um, opportunity to really take a break. There are moments of time. Um, but I would say this, uh, obviously that can't help but, it, but impact your personal life as well. And of course, we're all members of the community. So we're living through the, the very same challenges that each and, every one, uh, each and every one of us goes through. So, um, you know, I do find that, the, you know, I'm also getting used to working from home. I've gotten really good at using pretty much every uh, virtual meeting platform that exists, <laughs> as far as I know. Um, and, uh, you know, my, uh, my children have gotten used to seeing me. I think these things are permanently implanted or they're, you know, may become a formal uh, attachment to the body, the, uh, the ear AirPods or earbuds or whichever it is. So, um, you know, I would say that there've been lots of impacts, but again, lots of bright spots too, new connections, uh, different ways of working with people, uh, people stepping into roles that they had never done before. So, um, and shining. In them. So I think that, uh, you know, it's all a question of how you look at it. Thank you. Chief Archibald, how have you been um, holding up these past 11 months? Well, first of all, thank you for having me. Um, I do want to say a few introductory comments. Wachi uh, Nusui, Roseanne Archibald, Nutrition the Gassin, Thelka Thelka, Moshe the Gathelka, Ochiyan. I am coming to you today from my own home territory, um, um, Tagotagamo Nation territory. And I want to acknowledge all of you. Thank you, Pia, for reading the land acknowledgement. Um, uh, and you're all on somebody else's uh, territory, so I acknowledge that. Uh, and for as for the pandemic, you know, I was actually in Toronto when the pandemic was declared, because that's where our office is. And um, I immediately came home up to my traditional lands and territory, and I've been here since. I've been working out of my home. You can see in the background, <laughs> I'm in my living room, uh, which is, of course, beside the dining room. And this is where I, the best place for my desk was. And this has been probably the biggest change in my life because I pretty well lived out of my suitcase. I was traveling all the time as a public figure. I was invited to events uh, week after week after week after week. And so for me to be able to stay home has been a great blessing of the pandemic. I have really appreciated the opportunity to be able to uh, slow down a little bit in terms of the travel. 
Uh, I know some people love to travel and I do miss like the personal travel a little bit, but I really like staying home every day. I really love sleeping in my <laughs> own bed, cooking my own food. Uh, so I have to say I'm, I'm more of a look on the bright side of life person. And so uh, at the same time, it's been extraordinarily difficult for the communities that I work with. And our response in Ontario, uh, I have to acknowledge that it's been a strong response by First Nations. And at the beginning of the pandemic, the communities locked down uh, pretty hard at the beginning and kept cases low in that first wave. Uh, so we had 66 cases in the first wave. Um, and in the second wave, we've had well over 600 cases. So you can see the difference for us between the first and the second wave. And despite that, Ontario is still, when you look across Canada, of all the provinces, uh, the big provinces, we're fifth um, in terms of the number of cases in communities. And, uh, but we are the biggest, most populous region. So that speaks to the kind of leadership that exists in First Nations in Ontario. And I want to acknowledge that leadership, the local leadership who have done this work and have worked so hard to keep people safe and to keep their community safe and to preserve lives. So it's, uh, as Dr. Davila said, unprecedented is a word that uh, <laughs> I might not use either, um, but it's, you know, it's been, it's been mixed for me, but I'm really glad to be here today. Thank you, miigwech. Thank you, miigwech. Natalia, how have you been um, holding up professionally and personally for the last uh, almost a year now? Thanks so much, Tia. And let me acknowledge uh, everyone on this call. Thank you for the invitation. And I'm joining you from uh, Wampanoa Land in Massachusetts. And we, you know, we are facing a different situation. This year has been unprecedented, both because of COVID, but also because of an attack, a political attack on scientists in the United States. And I won't get too political, but I think that distinction is important. Uh, and that is why I was motivated to run for Congress, why I felt that more public health people, people with a social epidemiology background should step in uh, at a time when the United States was uh, turning inwards, turning away from the World Health Organization, turning away from sort of global uh, science and scientists. On a personal note, Pia, I'm a mom of a seven-year-old and three-year-old twins. And, you know, I, I know others on this call are also parents of, of slightly older kids, and it's been unprecedented at home as <laughs> well as at work. Um, you know, having schools shut down in March and suddenly going from being a working parent that basically at work you got your break to a nonstop, you know, something, something of a being. Um, so it's been difficult. And I think it's important to talk about the challenge of parents, of parents of young kids especially, um, but it's also been a blessing in many ways. You know, I'm seeing my three-year-old twins grow up, which under typical circumstances, I'd be at work from eight to six and they'd be at daycare. So there is something of a blessing there to, to be with them. But professionally, I say, you know, and you mentioned in my introduction that I ran for Congress. That was a crazy decision. And I had a partner who was willing to step in and take on the, you know, the household chores, but it felt urgent. And I think it has, you know, I think this pandemic has politicized the public health community in a way that we haven't seen that before. And I hope it sticks. You know, for those of us in social epidemiology, we have talked about racial inequities. We have talked about income inequalities. We have talked about the patterns of disease distribution and how they're distributed because of bad policy, but yet we don't step in to make the policy. So I'm hoping that there will be a real shift in who is leading and we will have more women leaders. We will have more uh, Native American, Native, you know, here in this, in the U.S., but of course, Indigenous leaders stepping into the decision-making. We will have more uh, people of color and we will have you know, the diversity that really we need to make better policies that work for everyone. So I'm excited to be on this panel, recognizing that women's leadership is at, you know, the forefront, but it should be intersectional in our discussion. Thank you. Laurel. Yeah, thank you for including me in this distinguished panel of heavyweights, uh, not least Pia. Uh, and um, I'm very pleased to be here. And um, I guess I would say, first of all, I'm grateful to be coming to you from the traditional lands of the Musqueam, the Sailtooth, the Squamish and the Coquitlam peoples here in, uh, well, I'm in Burnaby. Um, and uh, I, for me personally, I guess, uh, I, I really uh, found myself nodding when Chief Alexander was saying that she appreciated not traveling because at the beginning of the pandemic, certainly, usually March and April are incredibly busy travel months for me. And I definitely every year think I'm not going to do this to myself next year. And then I do it. Um, but this year, you know, I didn't have that. And it felt good to be home with my family and to be, you know, having a lot of together time. 
but uh, I think at this point I am ready to start globe trotting again <laughs> and uh, see some of the people that I haven't seen in a long time. You know, I think for me, I'm because I have, uh, you know, haven't lost my job and my thank, thank goodness, I'm not going to hear my elderly parents have not um, been sick. I'm very fortunate uh, to have my mother be in Nova Scotia and my father is out here in um, British Columbia. Um, so I feel very fortunate that they haven't been ill and, um, you know, my kids have done well. The, the biggest thing I think that gives me um, uh, pause these days that that occupies me and keeps me up at night is worrying about my my kids who are older they're not little kids so I, I, don't, I actually don't think I would have made it actually I think I would not <laughs> be here um, if my kids were little thank god they're teenagers but really I mean worrying about them in terms of my son starting at University of Toronto this year very um very difficult for him. I mean, imagine that first year experience, he's like living in a lockdown in his dorm room. It's like crazy, you know, he's very determined to go there and try to, you know, have a have an experience of some kind, but it's mainly an experience of zooming from his dorm room, which is just such a bizarre first year experience. It's almost, it's crazy. And my daughter started a high school, a brand new high school. Um, and you can imagine starting a new school under any circumstances is tricky and starting a new school, high school for your first time. I mean, what a difficult time. And, you know, she's, I, I've been really proud of both of them, how resilient they are. But, you know, that's the thing that really worries me most is, um, you know, how, what is it like them? They're both kind of extroverted kids and, you know, you worry, how are they going to connect with people? How are they going to have friends? How are they going to keep their mental health? A year is a long time. Think of how long a year was. So I guess that's the thing that kind of keeps me up at night these days, um, which is, you know, a reflection of how privileged I am in a lot of ways. But, uh, you know, also, uh, you know, I'm, it's kind of, that's my reality. Fair enough. Thank you. Um, so I'll just say um, to add a little bit of my experience. So I have three children. I have seven-year-old twins and a 10-year-old daughter. And um, yes, you know, this house is our home and our lives are filled with a bounty of privilege. Um, but I always um, like to say that that doesn't mean this hasn't been hard on each one of us. I just say, people say like, how's the pandemic? And I say, living my best pandemic life and it sucks because it does. Um, no one wanted this, no one wished for it, it's hard. But I, I really wanted to start our conversation today that way because I think just in the stories and the honesty that each of you shared might say something about women as leaders, right? So everyone was super honest and, and forthright and we didn't say everything's great and you know, kind of button up ourselves. And I think that's something we've seen through this pandemic, whether it's political leadership, medical leadership, leadership on the front line uh, through workers or in homes, that the idea of transparency and um, honesty has really shown the world and Canadians that it is valuable to not be buttoned up all the time and to show some of our human Humanity and to, to show our shared experiences and our shared concerns. So um, that was a bit of a litmus test to see where we'd end up, but I'm glad it ended up where uh, I think it should and, and we should. So um, to, to, to anyone, no matter what your gender, um, I think transparency and some honesty um, in leadership is a very valuable thing. Now, Talia, I want to ask you this first kind of big question. I want to start with political leadership because there have been umpteen articles written about how countries and jurisdictions with women at the helm politically have done well um, through this pandemic, whether it be the New Zealand's, Taiwan, Iceland, Norway. And, um, you know, there's debate about whether this is uh, correlation, causation, coincidence, malarkey, I don't, I don't know. But I guess um, what I want to ask you is what do you think that the present record indicates? And I'll go to Laurel after that. Uh, Laurel, you can just pick up when Natalia's done. And if anyone else wants to chime in, please do afterwards. I, mean, I, I don't know if it's causation. I do think that what you highlighted at the beginning, the idea that women lead in different ways, the transparency, the honesty, the not going into this um, sort of with the machismo that, you know, we are going to defeat this 100%. You know, we, we saw, you know, President Trump in the US basically deny that there was any risk. And I think it was part of that kind of male, very dominant leadership style of, I will have this under control in 30 days, then it became two months, you know, so that, that kind of more moderate, more humble, more unknown transparency, bringing in the right leadership, a more maybe coordinated response. I mean, I was honored to have Helen Clark um, join me in sort of a conversation around women's leadership when I was running, because she was trying to highlight that people like me who have not been in political spaces before could lead because we had other sort of skill sets. I think it's important to recognize both the challenges that women leaders face in normal times, but also how during crisis, 
maybe some of the risk averse kind of, you know, or risk averse, more collaborative, more transparent, um, you know, these are all obviously generalizations, but I think some of those skill sets and those expectations uh, played off well. And I think for the women leaders you talked about, you know, Jacinda Arden, I think she, for example, exemplified this calmness in a time of true anxiety, true uh, crisis for so many people, and people really were looking for that. They were looking for a calm, maternal sort of person. And what I heard on my campaign was people were saying, you come off as both very knowledgeable as a social epidemiologist, as a scientist, but also someone who's really nice. And nice in that term was described as a, as a positive term. And I think in times of crisis, the kind of that niceness of women is a positive. In times of other times, that's seen as, as a weakness. And I, we should talk about that, about, you know, why? Why is that? And why can't we have nice politicians? Uh, Laura, over to you. Yeah, I, I would say that um, if you look at the kind of, uh, so so many of these examples that you mentioned are ones that are at the forefront of people's minds. And coming from BC, of course, Bonnie Henry is the most prominent sort of face of our public health response here and has been wildly popular. Although, of course, people are starting to get a little crabby after a year. But um, but still, she's very, very popular here, you know, with people having the shoes that she wears and that kind of thing, um, you know, murals of her and so on. So I think that, you know, this has prompted much kind of speculation and, and many, many of it is kind of in some ways kind of using stereotypes to talk about why women are good leaders. Um, and, and the research that has happened, the kind of systematic research suggests it's a little more complicated than that. There is some connection, but it's a bit more complicated. And really the, um, really what it is is that places that have good governments elect women <laughs> rather than the vice versa. Um, and it makes sense, right? Places that have well-functioning institutions, wealthier countries, countries where um, women have more opportunity, there's more equality. These are places that are more likely to elect women in the first place. So in some ways, what we're seeing is that, you know, smart publics elect good, good women leaders uh, <laughs> rather than um, more so the women are doing things that are different. But but that's a, a it's a, most of the story, but there is a little bit of a different story, which is that there is some relationship here between women's influence and for and certain policies like school closures and i'm sure people in ontario can feel this very keenly which is that um, actually women leaders slowed down school closures um, they were less likely to close schools first um, and as people who have children <laughs> all of us on this panel um, uh, may have a different perspective now of course there's risk profiles and there's all kinds of other things when it comes to schools but one of the things is that um, uh, you know women leaders uh, have a very personal may have a very personal connection I should say to um, having whether their children are in school or not so that could be the source of that kind of uh, finding another thing is is that they're more likely to support um, uh, kind of generous uh, social response um, overall it seems uh, but that and that is kind of consistent with um, some influence of women leaders outside of pandemic circumstances. So I think, um, you know, the the kind of positive elements are there. One thing I would mention also, and this is the case of Bonnie Henry, and I can say this more generally later if we want to talk about it more, is unfortunately it's also exposed these very highly visible women to more harassment and assault. Uh, and this is 50 years since the UN has started working on the problem of violence against women in politics. And it's just an absolute disgrace that in addition to the politicization of these issues in the United States, which has increased attacks on people like Dr. Fauci, it's also increased attacks on these women in these visible roles. So I don't wanna um, let that slip by. Okay. Dr. Javila, Eileen, um, you know, uh, when we talk about the women um, who are leading the public health files in our country alongside Bonnie Henry, Eileen Davila often comes up. In addition to Bonnie Henry's shoes, Eileen Davila's scarves come up, but beyond her scarves, which is more important, which I, I, I point out because even we talk, like it, just in terms of the gendered thing, I know people are talking about Dr. Strang's ties in Nova Scotia, but I, I, I do find it a little bit interesting and I'm a bit irritated yeah. by it, to be honest, to be uh, talking about scarves and shoes uh, of women. So I just point that out. I know people don't mean it uh, necessarily in a bad way, but I, it's just something I've taken note of. I'm wondering, um, and I know you've been extraordinarily busy this past year, um, if you have thought deeply about your leadership style, which I would describe as calm and firm, um, smart as heck, determined, um, but have you thought about it? Um, and if you have deeply, where have you tried to pivot? And if you pivoted, why have you chosen to pivot? That's an interesting question, Pia. Um, and I have, I mean, 
you know, I don't know that I'm the best judge to determine whether it, I've thought about it deeply enough or, or thought about my own leadership. It, it's, it's, um, you know, it's difficult to, uh, you know, I, I like to think of myself as reasonably self-aware, um, but I know that I can only see the parts that I can see, right? Um, and so I, re I rely on others to inform um, and to help me understand my own um, leadership and uh, my role uh, throughout this entire pandemic. Um, you know, what I would say is this, when I think about it, um, you know, when I think about myself personally, right, we take on all these, you've heard everyone on this panel thus far, talk about the multiple roles that they take on, right? Um, sometimes it's as mother or as friend, as partner, as a coworker, colleague, daughter, sister, you know, what have you. Um, and each one of them carries its own um, importance and responsibilities and, and joys. Um, and I think what's interesting about that is that um, being able to fulfill those roles and recognizing that you have to fulfill those roles in, in, in differing amounts at different times has been the kind of skill that I think has been very helpful, both to uh, me as a, a, a you know, in, in my response to the COVID-19, uh, you know, pandemic and as well in the leadership, because you need different things at different times, right? Each situation needs to be assessed for its own, you know, on its own merits uh, and on its own characteristics and you adjust and flex depending on what you see. Um, so, you know, I don't know that there is a specific pivot point or a particular way to pivot. To my mind, it's a question of what do I see in front of me? How do I, you know, assess the situation in its totality? Because yes, there's a technical aspect that has a very medical component to it. But as you've just heard from other answers, there are things that we do to control the spread of virus. And then we have to think about the implications of some of the control measures. What might that mean for, for, for children? And what does that mean you know, for their families um, and for those who need to work and for whom uh, school provides that opportunity so that they can go to work, um, right? You have to really think all these things through. And to my mind, it's a little bit of a reflection uh, or a mirror image of that which happens within your personal life as well. Many different aspects that need to be balanced um, and many different perspectives that need to be thought through and you pivot according to um, what you see. The science is certainly there, the technical aspects are there, but there is much, much more to that in every situation that we found. And you just have to, uh, uh, you know, I guess pivot in, in accordance with what you see. And then sometimes you realize that might not have been the right pivot. And I think the important thing is to say, okay, then I can pivot again. Except for you, especially um, Dr. Davila, Davila, your leadership has been both public and um, you know behind the scenes. And so I'm wondering to that point, I'm sure publicly, sometimes you have to bite your tongue because we all do publicly, but um, does your leadership style change? Like how much of a pivot is it? I'm not asking is Eileen Davila the same person behind the scenes as she is publicly, but I guess what I'm trying to get at is, is it, is there a, a nuance and a finesse that you bring to it in different circumstances, whether it's behind the scenes or publicly? Yeah, I think I, I think just as with every situation, there's a little nuance and a different finesse or a different approach that you bring with each different circumstance. But I will say this, at the end of the day, um, I think we all have a certain core. We are who we are. And what I find fascinating, I think the thing that, 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 that speaks to me most on this issue is that uh, when I've had to be firm, for example, in my public communications, uh, my, uh, my boys have said, ah, oh, yeah, I, I know that voice. <laughs> I I've heard that voice before. And, and my husband said the same thing too. So I we, said, well, we can we hear it too as well. We heard it yesterday, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have to know you personally to understand what that voice is uh, imploring us. <laughs> Um, I don't know if you want to, and I, I, you don't have to, but just to Laurel's point about um, the increase in harassment of women's leaders, I don't know if you want to speak to that at all, um, um, Dr. Davila. Um, if you want to, please go ahead. If not, we can just move on. Yeah, you know, Pia, I, I don't mind being, I, I, as I said, I'm, I'm quite open, and I think it's important that we have these conversations. Um, yes, I have received my share of, of uh, you know, um, less than pleasant uh, interaction with the public. Uh, how's that for a diplomatic way to put it? Um, you know, and, and let me put it this way. I have no qualms. I think it's actually really important. It's a fundamental component of a democracy uh, that people have an opportunity to express disagreement um, and to air those views, but in a, uh, I think in an appropriate form 
and in a positive way. I think when the attacks are clearly, you know, uh, crossing the line where we're moving into harassment or they become sort of personal attacks that actually aren't about the issues, but are ascribing all kinds of uh, motivations um, and, and, you know, getting at specific characteristics that have nothing to do with the issues, you know, there clearly is, a, you know, a problem there. And, and we've heard that this is not something that's unique, uh, unfortunately, to, to uh, Canada or the United States. It's something that's being seen globally and something I think we need to talk about uh, more and more so that we can actually address it properly. Chief Archibald, as you said, you haven't been tra traveling as much, um, but you still have many communities that you um, are communicating with and in touch with. And I'm wondering about your leadership style in this past year, if you have pivoted, what you have learned about an effective leadership style as, as, a, as, a, as a woman, uh, but also as many other things, of, uh, of course, um, what have you kind of seen and taken in for yourself? Well, I, women in leadership have really performed admirably during this pandemic. And I know that um, the other panelists talked about some of the nuances, but I want to really boil it down to some central themes. Women have a balanced approach to leadership. Uh, they're emotionally intelligent. Uh, they can stay grounded in that deep and abiding love and care that's really needed during difficult times. And, but they can also be extraordinarily intellectual and capable in a crisis where they can think logically, strategically, collaboratively. Uh, in fact, research shows that women use both sides of their brain, left and right, whereas men tend to use the left side of their brain. And we've seen new leaders emerge during the pandemic and many of them have been women. Um, I don't think it's a coincidence that the majority of chief medical officers who have been providing guidance and advice to us are women. Uh, you know, Dr. Dr. Bonnie Henry's been mentioned, Dr. Teresa Tam, Dr. Dina Hinshaw, Dr. Eileen Devilla, who's on the call with us. Uh, my experience has been that First Nation women specifically ground their leadership in the seven sacred teachings. And to me, the most important and most powerful of those is love. That's one of the sacred, uh, seven sacred teachings. And I feel that being grounded in love is one of the key factors that creates that trust by the public to follow the public health guidelines. Because what they're seeing, and Dr. Devella just said this about her, you know, the mom voice, they see somebody who's loving and caring, providing good advice, you know, as opposed to a male political figure trying to direct them and talking about the war against COVID-19. I, I think the approach is definitely different for women. And in terms of my leadership in Ontario, I've really tried to create space because I think that that's what women also do in leadership is they create space for others other women, other kinds of leadership. There isn't this kind of need to hierarchically approach leadership. So it's about creating the space. And in that space, other leaders get to emerge. Other leaders get to fulfill their, their potential as leaders. And that's what's happened in Ontario. What's really happening in First Nations, why our numbers are lower than say everybody to the west of us, is because of local leaders. It's because of leaders on the ground. And how, how did we do that in my office? We did what other, uh, what other people are seeing. We provided them with good information, scientific information, <clears throat> the best medical advice that we could follow. Um, and we gave that to them and then allowed them to take that information and make informed decisions. And those informed decisions have kept communities safe in Ontario. So I think that's where I feel that my role as the regional chief has really been just make sure I'm getting the proper information out there and holding that space for good leadership. Um, I think we're going to go to questions soon, but I do. And I know Dr. Davila has to leave. I will just add to that, but um, I've noticed, and maybe this is, you know, not borne out in, in evidence, in fact, but one of the things I've noticed about women in leadership, and we're all doing it right now, is we tend to smile, even when, um, and, and that says a lot, I think our, uh, the way of communication, again, I don't want to paint big generalizations, but I think that warmth and that even when you're firm or stern or, you know, scolding, 
um, the care that comes across in, in the, all the other ways that we communicate in addition to our, what we're saying out of our mouths, um, I've noticed has been uh, somewhat differently, different um, by lots of women than their male counterparts. All this wonderful stuff um, against the backdrop of how hard this pandemic has been and um, the policy implications and the profound societal implications. We know that so many women, um, I mean, we can use choice or force, I think it's both, um, have had to leave um, whatever work worlds they were in. Um, I think sometimes we confuse the words perhaps choice and force because there may be a little bit from column A and a lot from column B rather than the other way around. It's been difficult. Um, and we've also seen um, conversations and ongoing ones, and I know Dr. Davila has, has talked a lot about it, about um, the need for uh, paid sick days and uh, paid leave beyond this pandemic, um, especially for our frontline workers who are mostly women and um, racialized women in a lot of industries, whether it be PSWs, healthcare, at our grocery stores and so on. Um, so I wanna talk about our policy kind of prescriptions. Um, to keep women um, being able to do what we want and because it's so necessary that we contribute to the, to the wider world, of course. But what are they during this pandemic and what are they beyond the, the pandemic? And do you see all this, like the downward curves of all the economic curves of like women are out of the force and we're losing so many women and will they ever be able to come back and can we rebound? So why don't I start with um, Laurel on that and um, we'll go, I'll go to um, Dr. Deville after that just because I know she has to sneak away shortly. So Laurel, why don't you start? Well, just quickly, um, in terms of can we rebound and how do we get women back into their jobs, opening schools, that's one of the things that I'm um, going to mention, but I don't mean just opening them and like letting everybody get sick, um, but rather under a, a kind of a safe, uh, I mean, you have to have the community transmission at a safe level, there have to be the kinds of things that have to be done. So, I mean, so I would say, first of all, there are key things. We have to be kind of confronting the reality of women's lives if we want them back in the job market. But the other thing I would say is there will not be an economic rebound without women in, in, in the job market. So whether they will come back or not is not just a question for us to think about if we're concerned about women, but if anybody wants to um, achieve economic development and growth, any kind of economic recovery first on their agenda has to be figuring out how to get women back into the workplace. So, Dr. Pia, Dr. you know, Dr. to add to that, yeah, I would completely agree. Um, you know, we are incredibly eager to see schools back up and running for in-person learning. Um, and obviously, one of the reasons for that is for the many benefits it provides to the children themselves, right? This is a really important aspect of, of, of children's health. But beyond that, it's about you know, our entire society's health. And absolutely, that involves uh, the ability of women to be able to, uh, you know, pursue employment outside the home and to be participating in all the aspects of life, including, um, you know, the economics uh, of life itself. So I do think that these are very, very important things. I think more broadly, though, from a public health uh, perspective, we know that what actually um, creates and maintains health is a little bit about healthcare and access to healthcare, that those are important things. But the really important parts obviously have to do with what we know are the social determinants of health, right? It is about all the, uh, the conditions within which we live. Uh, it's income, it's education, it's housing, it's social connectivity, it's sense of belonging, it's being able to actually realize your full potential and living in that kind of, of community uh, that is truly livable in every sense of the word. And I, I think that if we think about um, taking a very public health approach to um, recovery, if you will, from the pandemic as we, as we move beyond the, the very strict realm of response and start to imagine uh, life beyond COVID-19, uh, this is where we really need to renew our focus and effort um, and a significant component of that will be looking at how women can contribute and how they need to be beneficiaries um, in order for society to really um, come through this successfully and to have really benefited from the experience and, and to really put the lessons learned uh, into full motion. Natalia, why don't you go next and then uh, Roseanne will come to you about sort of policy prescriptions, what you wanna see in this immediate time or during the pandemic and then kind of post pandemic. And I agree with what has been said around schools being a central driver of why we have seen women either step back in terms of the hours as well as um, you know leave the workplace altogether. In the United States, I saw some data that um, 
for two months before COVID, it was the first time in the history that there were more women than men in the workforce. And now we've gone back to 1980s um, numbers. I mean, it is a real rollback and we have to acknowledge that. So there has to be some proactive measures that are put in place. It can't be left to, you know, we're doing this fairly. Like we will have to think about some targeted approaches. But there, we should also look at budgets. You know, one thing in the first bailout of the United States, Delta got more of a bailout than the entire childcare industry. And the child get industry is predominantly women and women of color in this country, in the United States. So thinking about what industries are predominantly, um, you know, women sort of staffed could give us some direction. So looking at budgets in terms of where our bailouts going through a gender analysis, I think would be really important immediately. Another thing I want to add is that we, you know, as we think about trade-offs, you know, it is important to talk about the trade-offs in their complexity and entirety and you know public health folks you know we're debating you know when is it safe to open schools we also need to recognize that the majority of teachers are, are women and so ensuring that they have safety the PPE because we don't want to see us getting women back to work but getting them back to work in an unsafe manner so the the narrative has to be get people back to work get you know wait staff in, in restaurants or uh, domestic support help make sure that they have access to the same protections the same um, you know that that you would so so there has to be that budget for for PPE and other and other sort of measures chief Archibald um, thank you Pia the in terms of policy and moving forward first nations have been disproportionately affected by covid even though our numbers are low, what we're seeing, for example, in Northwestern Ontario is we track all of our data through my office on the number of cases. We have well over 100 First Nation cases on reserve only. There are many off reserve that we're not tracking. And what we're seeing is that uh, that number is perhaps, let's say, uh, 14 or 50 percent of all the cases in Northwestern Ontario. But the percentage of the population of Indigenous people is much lower than that. So even though Ontario can say First Nations have done a great job at keeping numbers low, when you look and you dive into those numbers deeper, you really see that it's still a disproportionate effect. And so governments have to really understand that policies around First Nation and Indigenous people have to be brought to the forefront because what you're seeing are exactly what Natalie, Natalia said um, and Laurel and uh, as well as Dr. Davila that the, the issues around um, how we, we look at a, a particular issue in a budget sense um, and in a sense of what are the next steps and how do we begin to address these, um, I think the word that they use and I use it a lot as well is the uh, social determinants of health. And so those particular issues have to be examined and I agree with Natalia about a gender-based analysis and a gender-based lens to look at policies that affect women. But clearly, um, when you look into that, you have to look at First Nations as a collective, from my point of view, to bring us up to the same standards where we don't have to lock down our community so hard that we can begin to, to live in a world of equality where we can respond to the pandemic on the same level as everybody else. So there's a lot of catch up work to do for First Nations and even within the First Nations, there's even more catch up work to be doing around gender-based analysis of what the policies need to be for indigenous women moving forward. And Laurel, pick up on, on, on the point about the importance of gender equality and diversity in formulating this you know, effective um, public policy and, um, how, you know, how, how to support that, mobilize that effectively. Well, I would say that no matter what we do in terms of public policy, our response is going to be better if we are having a diverse team formulate and implement that policy. Um, and I, that's part of what I was trying to say earlier about women leaders mattering. It's not so much that on their own they can make a difference because I'm sure Dr. Davila will tell us all of these um, problems are complex and involve multiple dimensions and really there's, there are teams behind all of these decisions. We know from the social science research that diverse teams are better at problem solving. The harder the problem, the more important team diversity is. Gender diversity, racial diversity, ethnic diversity, um, you know, disciplinary diversity. So we really need to have teams making these policy decisions and not have a Lone Ranger style of decision making if we want to have good policy um, in the recovery and in the remainder of the pandemic. Okay, so we have some questions, Dr. Davila. I know you got a couple minutes and then you got to run. Um, 
Thank you. Um, I will just say you appreciate making time for all of us. Um, I don't know if you want to just put up your hands, panelists, if you want to weigh in on this. I'll just kind of throw it out there because it wasn't directed to anyone specific. But the question is, in your opinion, how do you feel about um, and how can we change the stereotypes about women as leaders, such as, quote, they have to be tough, quote, they are too emotional. I would just say seeing us is probably a good way to start changing that and how we do it. But um, um, does anyone want to kind of speak to that? Like, how do we, how do we kind of change that idea that we have to be a certain kind of woman or have a certain kind of style of leadership in order to lead effectively? Well, why don't I, I start off here just because my time is, is limited with you. Um, you know, I, I've, I've been asked a couple of questions along this, this uh, line of thinking. And, and for me, um, I think that uh, when it comes to public health, and I guess it depends on what the discipline is, but for, for me, when it comes to public health and leadership within the context of public health, the first and foremost is, you know, what are we trying to achieve? Let's be clear around what are our goals and objectives. Um, and then I think we need to be really clear eyed around okay, uh, if it's a, you know, particularly if it's a complex problem, the kinds that we've been talking about right now, how do we bring in the necessary perspectives? How do we bring that diversity of opinion and diversity of thought and diversity of skill and background and, and approach um, in order to uh, get us uh, in the most um, appropriate fashion to the achievement of those goals and objectives? Uh, and I think if we focus down on what it is that we're trying to do, and how do we go about doing that in a way that's respectful and, and um, appreciative of all of us that are part of the decision-making process, then all of that actually starts to fall by the wayside. I, I, I won't say that it's completely gone, but at least if we're focused on the goals and objectives, um, we can be very clear-eyed and um, very um, you know, uh, objective as, as much as we can be around is this method successful to get us to where we want to go? Um, and, and then I think you get a greater appreciation for the methods that got you there in the first place. Thank you again. Enjoy the rest of your day. We'll see you on TV around, what, four today? What time do we get to on our TV? <laughs> for three or four, we'll see you then. Pro Thank probably you. tomorrow, five Okay, yeah. all right, we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank um, let, you me, all. let me just continue with that, that um, question and, and maybe I'll go to, to you, Laurel, about this idea of women having to be a, a one certain um, monolith um, in terms of leadership style. Um, yeah. uh, you know, it's a stereotype and uh, a stereotype. that they want us to be. So well, I guess the better question is like, what are we gonna need to do to start breaking that down? I would say representation matters. Um, and you'll see different styles um, as we go along. And as Dr. Davila just said, eventually it falls down by the wayside. I think we don't wanna wait till eventually though, because so many right. of us are having opportunities um, pass us by because we aren't that quote unquote stereotype of a woman. Well, yeah, I mean, so in terms of uh, what will change um, public opinion, uh, first of all, you have to uh, see or kind of see these, these stereotypes in operation. You're absolutely right. Having more women in government will be the main uh, thing that will uh, change these views because they will see that women are, are different. And um, that's a kind of a learning opportunity. Beyond that, uh, there are, you know, most countries in the world have things like quota to ensure that women are elected. And they find that they're very um, effective in increasing the numbers of women in government. And unfortunately, that is the kind of measure that we need to have many places to get women into office, um, because especially in places that have our kind of electoral system, because there is a lot of, of bias um, and kind of preference for male leaders, even though as we've seen, women often do as well or better in those leadership positions. Um, and that's Leah, this question is for you. Um, you mentioned intersectionality earlier. What does this look like for policy development and implementation during the COVID-19 recovery? That's a great question. And also Chief Archibald alluded to this, that you know, if you're thinking about uh, indigenous people, indigenous women have unique challenges. We have seen in the US state at least <clears throat> that for indigenous, Latinx and black communities, um, people are dying at much younger ages. So 90% of white Americans are dying above the age of 65, but it's close to 40% or 30% are above the age of 65 for other groups. So you have to have a very different strategy because the exposure to COVID is happening in the workplace. It's happening in the way that households are maybe multi-generational. So you have grandparents living with kids, living with grandkids in sort of a small space and you have people working in essential jobs. And so we're not thinking about 
those kind of dimensions. So, you know, age, employment, um, neighborhood dynamics are all really important. So an intersectional lens doesn't say, you know, it's just women versus men, or it's not age, it is, or it's not race, it's it's all of those and, and your occupation. And, you know, as someone who's a social epidemiologist, it is complicated to put all those factors together, but I wanna highlight that because in our vaccination strategies, we sort of are not doing that. At least in the United States, we're saying age, everybody above 75, as if the risk is the same if you're above 75 and native, which it's not. You know, you should be giving access to vaccines to groups because of other factors too. So intersectionality in the response um, requires that we think about uh, the person in the many ways that they live their lives as a worker, as a parent, as you know, their cohabitation, but really important to make sure we're not equating racial inequities to biology. It is not race, it is racism. It is the way that our societies are structured. And so making sure, or blaming sort of a cultural behavior. I heard that early on, you know, oh, you know, some people are hug more. No, no, they are forced to work. They can't work from home. They're forced to be on public transportation. So making sure that we don't make generalizations and stereotypes around people that are not real or, or are, you know, problematic in the, in the COVID response. The next question is for Chief Archibald, and it's uh, what can Ontario do better and possibly mimic the success of female leaders in other regions? Well, I, I wanted to go back to what Laurel said uh, sure. as well around leadership style. You know, the, the best thing that women can do is be authentically themselves. So there is a an actual um, uh, system in place that expects a certain behavior of how politics runs in Canada, how it runs in Ontario, how it runs in First Nations. And that system has to be dismantled because it doesn't create space for people to be their authentic selves. Women, for example, I'm just gonna talk about myself. I'm very heart-centered. I, I very much think about my decisions in relation to the love and care that I have for people. You know, that's where I come from. That's where I live from. I live from my heart. And, and so that is an authenticity of me. And so all women have to find how to authentically lead from an authentic place. And then that begins to shatter the stereotypes of how women should lead. Um, what can Ontario do? Well, you know, I, I can only speak about my own experience of being the first of everything that's ever happened for a First Nation woman, um, being the first regional chief, the first chief, the first deputy, the first grand chief. All of those roles I found were really, um, for me to come into that role as the first woman, I've had to try and create space. I always talk about creating space and that's what we have to do. And Laurel talked, you know, a little bit about quotas. I really believe that when women enter into leadership and they are their authentic selves, they automatically create that space for other women. And that's what we have to do. And, and that is something you don't need to systemically change. You need to actually just get a woman in there. And I used to think about this when I was younger. I haven't said this in years, but I used to think that I would walk into this room. I'd be by myself with all of these men and I would see the door closing behind me and I, there wouldn't be this opportunity for women to come in. So as I matured and grew as a leader, I started to look at that door and I started to figure out how do I take the door off the hinges <laughs> so that that door doesn't exist anymore. And, and so that's what I think the obligation of women who are at the forefront of leadership, that we have that obligation to other women, that we are going to create space and we're going to open those doors. We're going to actually disintegrate those doors, take them off the hinges, and make sure that women can walk freely in the halls of power. And to me, that's something that every individual can do, and you don't need to do systemic changes, but you will, you will impact systemic changes as you do that. So if we take the doors off the hinges or um, have quotas or something, the inevitable backlash will be that we only got our jobs or we only got these leadership positions because of our um, sex uh, and or gender. So uh, Natalia, how do we sort of combat that old school thinking to be polite, <laughs> to put it that way? So two points. First to add uh, that we need to amongst ourselves uh, fight back this 
um, oppressive notion that there's only space for one or two women. Like I think quotas unfortunately creates this vision that there's there's going to be one or two women, and so we have to fight amongst ourselves for those two spots. Like I think there has to be this recognition that you know it could be a majority women on a panel. Like how do we that supporting each other doesn't actually put us in a competition. I saw this in my congressional race. There were nine of us running, four women, five men, and yet the narrative in the public was like, oh, the women are are going to split the vote as if. Like, why? Why would we split the vote? There was this kind of presum presumption that a certain type of, uh, you know, person votes for a woman and therefore they will have to pick between the four. And that wasn't the same narrative that was happening among the men. And so I think that was creating a, an energy among the women candidates is like, oh no, I have to beat out the other women candidates. But that's not true. Uh, we can sort of center our own abilities and, and actually together can show, and, and it was interesting, a man did win our race, but then it was all followed by women and then the men were at the bottom, the other men. So there, there was an, an interesting finding. Maybe, maybe there was something playing out there. So one is I think among ourselves to realize that it isn't a, scarce, a scarcity that we have to fight, that actually collaboration and, and being able to, as you know, Chief Archibald said, keep the door open, hold the door open, know when to take different roles, know when to step back. Um, that's one way, but you know your point, Pia, that people will say that we only got there because of X or Y. I mean, I think it's just I don't know. I don't know if we have to have to respond to that or just. Well, I, I will say as a, a woman who is racialized, I mean, we we all get it. It doesn't matter who we are. I just kind of tell myself, well, watch me, watch me, just watch me. You know. And I anyway. think you'll get it no matter what you do policy. I agree. I, mean, I agree. I, I, I used agree. to teach in the, when I taught in the United States, uh, affirmative action had been illegal for years. And I found that my students all believed that everybody who was in a prominent position was there because of affirmative action. So I don't think you can worry about, uh, you know, being too successful in what people are going to say for that score. I would say that in Canada, a lot of the women that we have in public office are already there because of, of kinds of quotas. So for example, I don't mean having reserved seats in the legislature, that's different. But the, but for example, the NDP has had a commitment that half of their um, candidates will be women. This kind of thing has actually made a huge difference to the number to the numbers of women running. It hasn't made the big difference you might think it would make because there are still resistance even with these kinds of policies in place. Um, and and it is and it and there is I think all the dynamics that Chief uh, uh, Chief, Chief Alexander and Natalia and and Pia have mentioned are all in, you know they're all um, they're all there. So I mean you know there's these kinds of things, but you see there there has to be one woman. The women are competing against each other. It's definitely a dynamic that's there. But I think. That, that kind of points to um, the necessity of, of some kind of an intervention. So I was really reacting to Pia's question about like, do we just want to wait for the long term? It will be a long time <laughs> if we wait for it to happen without some policy measures. And most countries in the world are not waiting and they have not seen a backlash. Um, and, and I don't mean that they have reserved seats. I mean, there are lots of different ways of doing this. There are ways of funding uh, women candidates. There are ways of encouraging parties to have quotas. There are ways of saying to the parties, you must run women in these elections. So there's lots of ways of doing it. Um, and I think that uh, some of those things are necessary because of the kind of continued attitudes of hostility towards women in public life. I think one of the, and this kind of leads to a question that's come um, from one of our um, viewers as well, but, um, that a lot, not a lot, some women, um, just what we were talking about earlier, the abuse, the misogyny, the attacks, the death threats, um, understandably, um, women are saying, maybe I don't wanna sign up for that part of being a leader and being out there, right? Like maybe that cost is just too high. And so that will keep us, um, you know, getting fewer and getting more and more women in into leadership positions in many many industries it's not just the political one um you you hear that abuse from uh many many industries but um this question um uh, comes from megan blacklock who says what are your thoughts on the increase in misinformation and the rise of the alt-right online how do we tackle this i, I just kind of want to tie those things together about the, the online world and often you know an online death threat is just as bad as an offline one in many cases so i just i, I always like to just say that that we could like to say, well, the online kind of shields us, but if someone's threatening to kill you, it's very scary either which way, frankly. Um, so I just want, I want people to weigh in on that sort of misinformation and, and, and stuff online. Um, Chief Archibald, do you want to begin there? <clears throat> yeah, thank you, Pia. I, you know, I, I really, I wanted to go back to what Laurel was saying. <laughs> Laurel, I really love your comments. Um, but I wanted to, to sort of string the ideas together in terms of policy. 
So uh, when you think about women and uh, affirmative action and all of this discussion around uh, what the policy changes need to be, we do need stronger policies on, uh, and we're starting to see that with the Proud Boys being uh, classified as a terrorist organization. So we're starting to see a real pushback against um, things that are, are uh, hateful and dangerous to certain groups and calling that what it is and, and denying that it has anything to do with freedom of speech. So I, I think that we really have to uh, figure out the, the, the path forward because I think that having that terrorist group uh, announced uh, and them being white males is a big step. And I think we've got to start to open up that path and, and make that path wider um, in terms of policy changes within government. So the declaration is one thing, but creating the policy is another thing. And I also wanted to go back to what Laurel had said or your question about, well, what do you say that you, you're only there because of the quota? Um, well, I can tell you for sure that there are actually people who still believe the earth is flat. <laughs> You know? and, and we all know that the earth is not flat. And so people who have this, ten, this belief that, that somebody has gotten to a place in life because of affirmative action or because there's a quota, to me are the flat earth thinkers. Um, because they're, you know, when I think about my own, um, my own leadership path, um, I've gotten to positions of leadership because I, I campaign, I, I do the things that everybody else does. I, there's no special rules for me. I've got to still follow the same rules for campaigning as everyone else. And I think that ultimately, the more women that are in politics and leadership, the more the people will see uh, authentic leadership and will want more of it. I just think that we're at the very beginning of women in leadership in First Nations, in, in Ontario, in Canada, in the world. And we just have to keep marching forward. I mean, these are difficult paths to walk. Like, I don't know if anybody's ever tried to break a trail with snowshoes, but that is hard work. But once you break that trail, like everybody who comes behind you is like oh thank god i can walk on this trail so we just have to keep walking forward as women that's it miigwech uh natalie or, or laurel do you want to if you want to add something uh, i just ask you to be brief because i think there's a couple more questions that we want to get to or we can just move on so up to you if you have anything to add we can do that i can just add really quickly i think the covid misinformation and the attacks are linked you know we saw that dr fauci has to have um, you know, security in the United States, 180 leaders of public health departments at the state and local level have quit or been fired. And those who have quit have been intimidated. Many of them have said it's because they've received public threats and have decided that it's just not worth it. So recognizing that COVID misinformation in this climate is what is driving a lot of the violence and the, the hate rec rhetoric, but beyond COVID, obviously the Proud Boys and the, you know, the alt-right will exist beyond COVID, but it's a certain group right now that is using COVID misinformation to intimidate scientists and people who we need in, in leadership. I think those, those two are important to highlight. Well, do you want to add anything? I would just say you're absolutely right that the harassment um, uh, is, is real and that it does drive women uh, from wishing to pursue public office or even to serve in, as public health officers. There's documented cases of women in the United States who just gave up because of threats against their children and families. Um, and that's just a shame for the public in terms of losing those leadership as well as a terrible violation, as um, Chief Archibald mentioned, um, of the kind of, uh, of, of rules about hate. Okay, this is what we call in journalism a sticky question, which means there's a lot to chew on on this one. So here we go. Um, it will be really important to start looking not at male or female leaders, but just good leaders as a whole. What are your thoughts of moving towards looking at the requirements of the role and what that entails? Well, why don't you start us off? Sure. Um, so, I mean, I think that that's, Perfect. That's, I think, the, the aim, right, is to have good leaders. Um, and the thing that we've seen is that where places where barriers are thrown up to um, women, for example, corruption is a big barrier for women in office. 
Um, you know, there are lots of, uh, you know, uh, lacking, uh, uh, you know, avenues into office, those prevent our countries from getting the best leaders. So I don't know that I think that there, this, this, the, the, the question creates a dichotomy between thinking about women and men or thinking about good leaders. And I'm not sure that I buy that because one of the things is right now we are not getting the best leaders we can because too many women are being driven out of the pool and too many women are being discouraged. They don't have the, um, they're not willing to, to run the gauntlet that is required to be there. Far from affirmative action, it's very, it can be very difficult. But we know that when women run, they, they can do well and that we want that as a society. We want that expanded pool of candidates so we can get the best leader, the leader who does the best job. Um, and so I, I kind of reject the question. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I hear it a bit as a kind of the question about merit, right? Shouldn't the best person just get the job? But I'm not sure if that's the um, questioner's intention, but, but chew on that a bit for me, Natalia and Roseanne. And Natalie, I'll go to you first about, um, you know, not looking at this through a um, lens of male or female, but just good leaders as a whole. I mean, I, I agree with everything Laurel said. Um, what I can add is that, you know, if we start thinking about characteristics and, and we've talked about some of those, showing empathy, showing love. I love that the chief mentioned love as a, as a characteristic of leadership. Like I've never heard of that outside the context, you know? So if we were able through media, through other ways to, to start elevating these characteristics and that be equated to being a good leader, I do think that we would see more diverse Profiles and and of course it, it sh we shouldn't simplify to to men and women but until we remove the obstacles and as as Laura said we are we are creating an imagery of what is a good leader and a good leader often corresponds with someone who's decisive who does not collaborate who you know and and so the terms around it um, become gendered and and I should add that other than you know the the self you know, the reasons why women don't run, there are obstacles around the, along the way, you know, fundraising, having a network of other leaders who will kind of help you through, open the door or remove the hinges. Like there are so many obstacles, even once a woman has decided to run that make it harder for, for women to, to win. And then once they win to stay and, and move up. I think it's always, I think language is so important. Like when we use the word decisive, just because a style might be to listen and collaborate doesn't mean you're not being decisive. It just means you're hearing all the voices at the table before being uh, decisive. And I think how we talk about how we communicate and, and how that's attached to male leaders versus female leaders is, is always interesting. Um, Chief Archibald, uh, about this idea about just having a, a good leader. Uh, yeah, you know, there are, uh, I just did a course actually for work <clears throat> on unconscious bias and how people carry unconscious bias as they go through life. And not only is unconscious bias something invisible and that we are not aware of, we are also not aware of the construct of politics. We're not aware of all the invisible rules and the constructs around what leadership is within a Canadian context, within Ontario, within First Nations, that the construct itself is built uh, to ensure that a certain type of person is elected. And you just, you know, you talked about being decisive. So there are these unwritten rules. There's the construct that we actually is it's it's invisible and it's hidden, and that's why I think it's it's actually uh, existed for so long. That that construct is what we have to begin to dismantle, um, because it does have a bias toward male leadership. That's all there is to it. And of course, why as a male leader would you change? the rules of the game or the construct that is around you when it will no longer serve you. So that's what the system is. And that's, that's what First Nations fight against all the time is that the system, the larger colonial system itself is based upon certain premises. And one of those is the domination of white males as the, um, the source of leadership and, uh, you know, and the patriarchal kinds of colonial um, constructs that exist that we're still living with and we don't even know it. And, and it's about educating people about that construct and then deconstructing it and rebuilding something in its place. But I do like this one quote from, uh, uh, I think it's Buckminster Fuller who said, you know, we shouldn't fight against and try and like continually fight against the system. We should construct a system that is a good alternate to the existing system and make that system obsolete. And that's what we have to do. This system is becoming obsolete and we have to continue to construct a system where 
um, where women are welcome, where women's leadership style is, is honored, uh, where women can be safe, where women can be respected, and where women can be themselves. That is um, a good segue to the last question, and um, then I'll hand it back over to Tani uh, in just a moment. But I, again, I want each, um, each one of you to respond to this. Um, how do you envision a healthy and positive recovery taking place? In other words, what will this look like a year, maybe a little more uh, from now? Chief Archibald, do you, want to, do you want to start on this one? How do you envision a healthy and positive recovery taking place? Well, you know, again, I, I have to speak from the First Nation perspective uh, because that's the world I live in. And what, and I've told this to Minister Mark Miller several times uh, that when we do the rebuild and come out of this pandemic, we have to invest in First Nations in a substantive way to bring all of the housing up to standard so that we don't have 18 to 21 people living in one house. That's what's happening in Manitoba. You know, one household, one person gets COVID and then suddenly there are 18 cases because there are 18 people living in a very small house. So the government of Canada and the government of Ontario, in my view, have to invest in the infrastructure within communities. So that's not only housing, but clean water, proper roads, proper services, proper buildings, so that these communities can thrive that they can be vibrant. And so that government investment is really important. The second part of it is that there has to be an access to wealth and to build wealth for First Nations because it's not just about government funding. It's about First Nations having access to their resources, to their land, so that they can build wealth, so that they can be self-sufficient. So I think that we've got to start to open that up rather than have policies and laws that really shut out First Nations from accessing wealth. We've got to open that up somehow. And then the third part is the social safety net. We really have to think about not only the economic recovery, but what are the policies and laws that we need to put in place that will ensure that people are safe in communities, that they have mental health supports, that they have family supports, that they have access to healing. The biggest problem in First Nations is intergenerational trauma from residential schools. We have yet to really create a big plan on how to finally get through that intergenerational trauma so that the cycle stops today. So I think those are big issues, but that's what I believe. Thank you. Laurel, and then we'll go to Natalia. Laurel, um, so the question just uh, is, how do you envision a healthy and positive recovery taking place? What's this all going to look like a year or so from now? Yeah, I think the recovery, um, the recovery kind of depends on our understanding of what the things that we've learned during the pandemic. And I think the pandemic has revealed both the strengths of Canada as a country and the places where those strengths are fraying a little. Um, so, you know, I think having lived in both Canada and the United States over the past 25 years or so, uh, I would say that uh, having our healthcare system, our public healthcare system here in Canada has been a very important reason why uh, it has not been worse here. If you look south of the border, it's been really pretty terrible. Um, and one of the reasons is this um, healthcare system. And that healthcare system has been fraying um, and it needs more investment as all the premiers have been um, pointing out. So I think that, you know, in addition to some of the investments that we've seen, all of our investments in, on the, in these public uh, infrastructure, um, we've seen all of our weaknesses. We've seen how the, how the pandemic has made all of these inequalities worse. So we have to take care of these vulnerable people, whether it's long-term care homes or Indigenous communities. We have to kind of make sure that our most vulnerable places are protected and reinvest in these public um, elements, education, health, fundamentals that make Canadian society strong, I think have to be um, the kind of way we go out uh, strongly um, to build on these strengths that we have and, and, and mend the holes that have become uh, apparent during the pandemic. And I'll jump in to agree with what has been said to add a dimension of the global. I think equity, you know, we need to think about equity at the local level, whether you're talking about the US or Canada, but at the moment we're seeing a global pandemic and in terms of the vaccine access being so unequal. Um, you know, Dr. Tedros, the head of the WHO said something that it sh should shock all of us. Um, you know, last month only across Africa, there had been 25 vaccines distributed total. Now the number has gone up into the thousands, but we're talking about vaccinating 3% of the world outside of sort of the wealthy countries. While, you know, in the US we're scrambling to get to 75%. We will not have 
a recovery that is sustainable unless everywhere, every country is able to benefit from the public health tools and technology that we put forward. So that's number one. And number two is that we need to think about rebuilding in a way that brings us forward, not backwards. The countries that have suffered the most, including the United States, were highly unequal before. So when we move forward, we need to take equality and you know all these inequities, whether we're talking about along racial lines or gender or income really seriously if we want to prevent a future pandemic from shutting us down again for a year. So it's been a horrible time. And we need to know that in one year, this is not gonna be over for the rest of the world. Some countries might take two, three, four years to get their vaccines, but unless we kind of build that solidarity, the global solidarity, uh, we're all in trouble. And the rebuild will take um, uh, some time. So to keep our eye on the prize and what we remember that we've learned from this time and, and keep at it. Thank you all three, I appreciate it. And to Dr. Davila as well. And um, to everyone watching, thank you. I'm gonna turn it over, uh, back over just to, for some closing remarks to Tani. Thank you. And thank you everyone in this exceptional discussion that we had, it's been absolutely enjoyable and uh, thoroughly enlightening. I will not try to summarize this very rich and wide ranging uh, discussion, um, but just to say that uh, some themes seem to emerge from the overall discussion. One was that, you know, the issue of gender equality and diversity and equity, these themes are central to the way in which we can see a recovery coming forward. Um, we have to be able to also uh, acknowledge that there are specific gender dimensions, whether it is to the leadership uh, strategies and the way approaches that leaders have taken, or in terms of identifying the needs of communities in, the, in terms of designing the recovery going forward. So, um, you know, when uh, Dr. Davila talked about uh, the social determinants of health, uh, it really struck a broader, broader chord of how these, the recovery should be, you know, in terms of the structural issues that need to be as, uh, addressed in terms of access and equity. Um, uh, Chief Roseanne's uh, points about how particular communities have been scrambling to even make it to an equal starting point, let alone thrive and to be able to uh, to build back better. Um, these are going to be challenges going forward. And um, I do uh, think that, you know, the, uh, the various aspects of uh, policies that were discussed, whether it was from paid leave or social safety nets or looking at uh, the opening schools, the reality of women's lives in terms of uh, how to get back on track with the economic recovery. The fact that this economic recovery cannot be undertaken without women's full participation back to levels that were there before and you know, going forward to actually having equal um, access at the workplace. Um, you know, th these require proactive measures and they require a renewed focus uh, and I, I particularly enjoyed the discussion where you don't need to see these as trade-offs, but more as reinforcing measures that will be able to put together the building blocks of coming back with a recovery program. So whether it is immediate measures based on the best scientific uh, reasoning and uh, arguments about when school openings are uh, determined, how to get people back in the workplace, what kinds of protective measures they are provided with. Uh, the, the longer term recovery has to be able to respond to integrating women's concerns in the process. So whether it is addressing violence against women or women's access to uh, positions of authority and, and facilitating them, I, uh, you know, the, the analogy of breaking, taking the door off the hinges is really a powerful one. And, and so is the, you know, the, the seven sacred uh, teachings where you said love is going to be one of the signature ways in which this recovery can be built back. And I think um, in terms of women's leadership, that is a very powerful uh, measure uh, that I, I think this would, um, from this session, I would take. 
I would like to thank all of you for this very wonderful session. And uh, I hope you have enjoyed uh, the, the conversation as much as we have. Um, and I hope there will be other opportunities to engage with you going forward. Um, and thank you so much to Pia, our host for today, who, for your wonderful facilitation and to all of you, to Natalia, to, Dr., uh, to Professor Weldon, to Chief Roseanne. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.